Good morning, I'm Dean Glass with Save Our Heritage Organization, and I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for SOHO's very first Penning the Past lecture. Today we present Catherine Hahn, a passionate advocate for preserving the rich history of North Park. Catherine serves as the secretary of the North Park Historical Society, and her deep connection with the neighborhood's past began over 35 years ago when she moved into a bungalow near Morley Field. Her fascination with North Park's history has since become a driving force in her life. In her role as editor and publisher of Donald Covington's classic history book, North Park, a San Diego Urban Village, 1896 to 1946, Catherine gained extensive knowledge and a profound appreciation for the historical roots of North Park. Her dedication to preserving the heritage of this vibrant community didn't stop there. In 2014, she collaborated with fellow North Park Historical Society members to compose the Arcadia book, San Diego's North Park, and her monthly articles for Uptown News evolved into the 2019 book, History Snippets, Past Matters Stories of North Park. Today, Catherine is eager to share the compelling stories found within the pages of the North Park book she has played a pivotal role in producing. If you have questions, please type them into the chat feature and Catherine will answer those at the end of the program. So without further delay, let's welcome Catherine Hahn, dedicated historian and storyteller, as she takes us on a journey through the fascinating history of North Park. Thanks, Dean. That was lovely. And I really appreciate being uh, invited to, to do this and being the first one. So you'll have to uh, you know forgive any mistakes or uh, insanity that might happen. Zoom is always a little nerve wracking for me personally. Um, so this lecture is um, actually drawn, as Dean said, from three sources. Uh, the, the North Park book, we call it the North Park book uh, by Don Covington, which really is the essential history of the first 50 years of North Park's development. And that was based on research that he and others um, of the history committee conducted uh, over nearly two decades uh, in the 1980s, they, the history committee started and said, let's write a book, that'll only take a couple of years. <laughs> and um, unfortunately got a little delayed with, um, uh, with Don passing away. And, um, and then I was happy to help his widow and get it put um, together and published in 2007. And then the Arcadia book was, as Dean said, a collaborative effort um, with our um, with our group, about a dozen of us. And we really appreciate Arcadia um, publishing because they allow communities, groups to um, have a template and um, you give them the text and the, and the photos and um, they put it together into beautiful books, which you've seen for lots of different um, communities. So we're really, really proud uh, that in 2014, North Pitt, Park became one of those um, communities. Very happy with that. And um, and then my book is, of history snippets was put together from about six years of monthly columns uh, written uh, as a volunteer and voluntarily accepted uh, by Uptown News. And I really appreciate them um, doing that and then allowing me to um, put the book together. So um, a little bit more shameless marketing. This is uh, the place to find those books, verbatim books on the corner of 30th and uh, North Park Way is a, a building that you can't miss and a, a store that you shouldn't miss. You should really uh, go in there. They have wonderful books and um, they've been a really great supporter of um, many local authors, um, not just history. And um, so that's definitely a place to go in, in North Park. So um, I'm gonna answer some of the frequently asked questions that we get as the North Park Historical Society. Uh, where is North Park exactly? Many people want to know. Uh, why don't North Park streets line up and who can we blame for all that? Um, how did North Park develop? What architecture is typical in North Park and who we are as the North Park Historical Society? So lots of people ask us, where is North Park? Um, there's arguments and um, some heated discussions sometimes about that. So this quote is from the San Diego Daily Transcript in 1909. The city council has as yet been unable to determine the exact boundaries of the North Park edition. 
And so if you're confused, um, you know, don't worry, you're in good company. People have been confused for more than 100 years. And what makes it confusing, um, this map is on the inside cover of the Don Covington book. What makes the location of North Park confusing is there's a lot of overlapping boundaries and there's um, a developed as a patchwork of individual little tiny, tiny subdivisions, some less than 60 acres um, through um, a early times when there was really no city planning. And um, this is what happens when, when, when that's allowed. But um, in this map, um, which I don't want to have everyone's eyes glaze over, but I, I, I this is uh, Mission Valley here on the um, edge of the map. And then here's Balboa Park and Morley Field and the pool. And this is Yupa Street here. And um, here's 28th and Juniper. And over here is Park Boulevard, and this is the 805. And what everything that's covering the aerial photo in an opaque color is the Greater North Park Community Planning Area, which was defined by the city in the 1980s. They kind of mushed together different historical subdivisions um, to try to, with the boundaries being major streets, to try to help with their um, planning purposes. And um, so here's University Avenue here. And so what the map is showing is um, between University Avenue and Boundary Street, which was the uh, initial boundary of the city of San Diego at, at one time, and Yupa Street down here, these this little block of subdivisions, these developed um, and were mapped and those maps were laid out by surveyor and they were filed with the county assessor and they became official subdivision maps. These little tracks were, um, that happened, that mapping happened in the 1870s. So that was a long time ago. And believe me, there were no cars around to make anybody wonder, uh, maybe it matters that these things don't line up because for them, the horse could make the turn. It wasn't a problem. And then to the north of, of what's now University Avenue, what we see here is just half of the very large tract of University Heights that was laid out and mapped and filed in 1888. And this is, you can see University Heights, you know, when you're driving around, um, things match up a lot better because it's very large and it goes off the edge over to the 163. That's how big University Heights um, as an initial subdivision was. If you wonder where Burlingame is, this is the famous um, tract of, of Burlingame. And um, sometimes they like to pretend they're not in North Park, but they are in the greater North Park community planning area. Um, Culturally, I guess they feel like they're more a South Park uh, place, but they definitely were part of the uh, North Park initial tracks that were developed in the early 19, uh, 1900s. Hartley's North Park, what we'll talk about a little bit more later, is here in this little square. It was a piece of um, acreage, 40 acres that were bought out of um, this initial um, Park Villas tract that ends up in two pieces that I'll mention in a little bit. Okay, that's all I'm gonna do on this map and before you guys all go crazy. This is the University Heights um, map of 1888. This um, tract extends, like I said, from over where 163 is now to over where um, Boundary Street is. And um, because they were a unified uh, subdivision, they, um, they had some nice themes uh, that made some sense for them, uh, for their streets, their states that go north-south. Those um, street names were named after states. And um, some people wonder, is that, um, what's the order? You know, is it when they came into the union or what? It certainly isn't alphabetical. Well, it's a crazy road trip that starts up in the northeast corner of the United States with Maine drives down the East Coast through New Hampshire and Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, Delaware, Maryland, and North Carolina, and then um, goes across the uh, South 
from Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Arizona, California, and then goes up north, Oregon and Idaho and Utah and back into uh, the Midwest, Kansas, Nebraska, Ohio, Illinois, Iowa, and Missouri. And you say, well, where's California? Well, that became Hamilton um, Street in the um, early 1900s. And we lost that uh, name because there already was, um, actually there were several California streets and only one could um, remain. And so it was the one in um, Old Town area because that was the oldest um, street. So um, then of course the, the um, streets that go east and west were named after um, presidents originally, and then some things got um, changed. And what we know now is University Avenue was named for Millard Fillmore originally, Fillmore. And you see University here, that's now El Cajon Boulevard. Why was it called University? Because they had the idea of they were going to have a campus of the University of Southern California here on this site, this, on this campus site. And it was all gonna, the big boulevard of the university was gonna lead right to that campus site. But unfortunately there became some very poor uh, economic conditions throughout the US um, in the time frame of the 1880s and that sort of squashed the plan. But later uh, a teacher's college was built on this site and that is called the normal school. And because it's a um, Ecole Normale is a school that um, teaches standards to teachers, started in France. And this is the beautiful um, campus of the State Normal School. This postcard is from 1906. Um, all that is left now is um, the annex down at the end, but what a beautiful building that was. So that's kind of a way to say why our streets don't line up because they're individual tracks and nobody cared when they were mapped. But who can we blame? That's the most important question. We can blame these guys. Um, this is Joseph Nash over here. And this is William Jefferson Gatewood. And these guys were, um, both men came to San Diego in um, 1868 when San Diego was a very new, very tiny little place. Joseph Nash was an enterprising merchant uh, and a land dealer, a uh, wheeler dealer, really. Um, he was originally from England. He set up a shop on the wharf. He rented space from Alonzo Horton. And it was his store that young George Marston, his clerk, um, bought in 1873. And that was the start of Marston's department store. And Gatewood came to San Diego to establish the Union newspaper. Um, he'd been encouraged to relocate from um, up in San Andreas, Northern California, by pioneer Philip Crossway, whose sister happened to be Gatewood's wife. And Gatewood sold his part of the union in early 1869, pretty soon after bringing it down here. And he built a successful law practice in addition to dealing in real estate. So what did these guys do? They mapped um, their... Uh, little subdivisions in a way that brought about all of our little dead ends and, and dog legs. Um, Joseph Nash bought the blue pieces um, and that included then later Hartley's North Park was um, bought out of that. And William Jefferson Gatewood bought this uh, little, the part in green from 28th Street over to Ray Street uh, in between. And Nash's lands became the Park, park Villa subdivision and it was mapped in 1870, but it wasn't officially filed until 1887 um, due to a legal dispute that went all the way to the California Supreme Court. And in between his pieces, Gatewood named his part the West End Subdivision. And he followed uh, what he really liked, how Alonzo Horton had laid out Newtown. So that's how um, Gatewood laid out his little subdivision. And he um, kind of wanted to echo that downtown theme. And so his east-west streets were actually originally named uh, First through Seventh Avenue. And that is now what we have, White Men, North Park Way, Gunn, Landis, Dwight, Caps, Myrtle, and Upas. So he has two additional east-west streets. And he also has uh, different street widths, block, and lot patterns. 
So you can kind of see that Gay would like the short blocks, a lot of corner lots, which he felt as a real estate kind of person, those were worth more. Uh, he liked wide streets. You notice that the minute you um, drive into this part of, of North Park is suddenly there's these huge um, boulevards really. Um, and he liked um, no alleys. Oh, the rumor is, you know, Alonzo Horton didn't like alleys either. He just felt those were not good places, a waste of land. And um, I, Gatewood agreed with him. And then you can see that, um, and if you've ever been out in this area, that Joseph Nash did the longer blocks and he had longer um, law pattern and he did do alleys. I think as a merchant, maybe he thought that was a good place to have your cart and your horse. And um, so he felt it was a good investment in the land to, uh, to have those alleys. But even though these streets didn't match up on paper, nothing really happened uh, for quite some time. And this land was, um, but the official maps were filed. And that was as people started then finally to come, that was the pattern that was um, laid out. Okay. So in the early times before 1900, Again, all that um, subdivision mapping was just on paper. So the early residents had the orchards and farms. And in 1900, there were seven landowners and 55 residents between Florida Canyon and Boundary Street. And this is the Richardson House. Um, it was built in 1894, and it actually does still exist. It's on 31st Street. It's quite a bit altered, it's, um, and it probably was moved from across the street to um, to the east side of the street. It probably was originally, the farmhouse was originally on the west side of the street, but it is still there. Another uh, North Park family was William Homer Osby and his wife, Willie Alice Goodwin Osby. Um, they lived at Arizona Street, just south of El Cajon Boulevard before 1910. And Alice Osby was part of the large Goodwin family who um, was headed by her parents, Jefferson and Sarah Goodwin, who were also living nearby at 4329 Oregon Street in uh, 1910. So the Hartleys were um, neighbors of the Richardsons um, prior to 1900. And this is the fa Hartley family headed by Mary Jane and James Monroe Hartley. Um, and they had a profound influence on the development of North Park. So in this picture, um, here is James Monroe, uh, their youngest son, Paul, and wife, Mary Jane. And then in the back are their children, Delia, and George, and Maud, and John, known as Jack, um, Hartley, and Mary. So James Monroe Hartley bought 40 acres of land within the Park Villas tract in 1893, and he named it Hartley's North Park. And the empty land was bordered by, as you saw on the map, University Avenue and Dwight Street on the north and south, and Ray and 32nd Street on the east and west. And that was planted in lemon trees. They're originally from Kansas, and they moved to their North Park land to establish a citrus orchard in 1896. And they lived in a farmhouse at what is now University Avenue and 31st Street. But scarcity of water made citrus farming difficult. And But as things happen in life, the orchard's failure was one factor that led to North Park's urbanization. And another big factor was the streetcar. So public transportation in the early 1900s was the key to the urban development north of downtown San Diego. Because at this time, individual cars were just a rich person's toy. And so people rode the streetcar to commute. And these um, photos illustrate why urban development did not begin in North Park until around 1910. The canyons and the hills were a significant barrier. Um, and so what happened is, first of all, the hill at Georgia Street, which is in this um, picture at the top, was excavated in 1907 so that the number seven streetcar could extend from Hillcrest East to all the way out to Fairmont Avenue. And this is a little Redwood Bridge and this connecting Redwood Bridge over um, for Georgia Street to continue across this big excavation now. 
was built there because there already were some homes on Georgia Street and they didn't want to just isolate those people. And then the other um, piece of infrastructure that helped connect the transportation system was the original bridge over Switzer Canyon, which was built in 1908 for the number two streetcar to come north from downtown up to UFAS and then up to University Avenue in 1911. And the intersection of the number two streetcar line and the number seven line at 30th and University became the busy corner, the commercial heart of North Park. So with problems of topography solved, the streetcars were able to carry people to this part of San Diego and that created the market for homes. And this photo shows Calmia Row in Burlingame in 1912, which was quite the, um, quite the subdivision. You know you're in Burlingame with the red sidewalks and they did that on purpose. So you would know when you were in Burlingame and when you were not in Burlingame. So as North Park grew, the streetcar system needed more capacity. And so in 1914, the number seven streetcar line was double tracked and University Avenue was widened under Georgia Street. And that necessitated vertical walls and a new bridge made of concrete was put in in the city beautiful style of architecture. And this picture is from 1929. The bridge was, uh, as many of you know, I'm sure, recently seismically retrofitted. And what they did is they recreated the entire bridge above these um, big three main arches. They kept the original uh, main arches. And, um, and then the vertical walls were recreated by using these original walls as a, basically a vertical foundation. And they built new uh, vertical walls in the same um, style because the bridge is um, on the National Register, rightfully so. So after the streetcar came, the Harley family recognized the value of their fallow orchard for urban development. And Jack Hartley led the family after their father, James, died in 1905. Uh, they started the development of their land for urbanization in 1912. And this picture shows the initial grading of streets for Hartley's North Park. And they're using real horsepower here. Mm -hmm. The real estate office of Jack Hartley and his brother-in-law, Will Stevens, who was married to Delia, is shown here in 1912. And it's where the team initiated the commercial building boom at 30th and the university. This is the three-story commercial building, the first high rise um, in North Park, uh, Jack Hartley and Will Stevens built in 1913 at 30th Street and University Avenue. A pharmacy dominated the first floor for more than 80 years, starting with J.L. Haggard's soda fountain and Joseph Hallowell's North Park Drug Storm, which is in the picture here, uh, and later Robertson's Pharmacy and Pioneer Pharmacy. Through the 1920s, a special counter in the drugstore served as the U.S. Post Office for the community. So their office building at the corner of 30th Street and University Avenue was until recently the Western Dental Building. Um, North Park Main Street has proudly set up shop um, on the second floor now, activating uh, the building after Western Dental uh, moved out. Um, you see these ornate um, towers. Those are actually still there um, behind the smooth facade that um, extends from the, from the building um, now. Uh, lots of people get excited when they see this picture, um, especially uh, third graders. We took on a walking tour <laughs> last year. I was like, wait, that's that sign's above the street. That's not where it is now. That's right. But initially, the hanging North Park neon sign was placed above this intersection, uh, the University and 30th Street in 1935. It was removed in 1966 and then recreated on a pedestal at Kansas Street in 1993. And we'll talk about that a little more. Here's the original sign uh, when it was just, um, this is the next morning after it was installed in um, 1935. The first uh, neon North Park sign could not be hung above a public street until an amendment to the city's sign and billboard ordinance was approved by the city council in late February, 1935 to allow quote, 
electric signs across streets from sidewalk to sidewalk, as reported in the February 27th, 1935 Evening Tribune. The amendment was requested by the North Park Businessmen's Club, which is now basically what North Park Main Street is. The cars in the parade here are headed to the 1935-1936 exposition in Balboa Park. They are Fords. This is how the hanging sign looked in 1958. It's gained, uh, we love this scallop shape that's kind of become emblematic of North Park. Um, and this is, of course, the Toyland Parade. And here you can see the little banner home of the famous Toyland Parade. This is 1958. And now the North Park sign uh, that when it was put up in um, 1993 through the actions um, of a group of dedicated community people, um, it's a little different location, right? It's farther to the west and it's um, on a pedestal and it's not hanging over the street. But we still think it's very attractive and we love it. So a safe and reliable water supply is another um, just essential piece of infrastructure for um, domestic use and for firefighting. And that's a key to development just everywhere. Water supply at adequate pressure became very important as North Park grew. And this 1947 photo um, is a view of the city water facilities looking northward from what is now the North Park Community Park. And this is showing the multiple water storage and treatment facilities in North Park. So the water tower, 127 foot high, that was built in 1924 to hold more than 1 million gallons of potable water, high enough to provide adequate water pressure throughout the area. Because we didn't have big pumps back then, so they needed to get the water up high to have the kind of pressure that we needed to get out to everywhere in case there was a fire somewhere, but also adequate pressure for everybody's um, home in North Park. Um, and so what also this picture is showing is something that isn't there now. This is a 52 foot high water stand pipe uh, that's in the middle there. Um, and that was installed in 1910 and it was removed in 1952. And then there are, um, what you can kind of see, they're a little bit washed out, but the, these are redwood tubs along the front here. And they're part of a water filtration uh, plant that operated from 1928 to 1952. And that's where Howard Avenue is now. And then uh, what we kind of see in the foreground are these wooden planks. This is a cover um, on there on top of a 17 and a half million gallon reservoir that was built in 1912 and demolished in 1967. And that's the site of North Park Community Park now. That's why all that land was available. It had once been uh, part of a, a um, water reservoir, basically, sort of half buried and half raised. The water tower has actually been empty since the 1990s, and it was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2013. And then that rectangular concrete, those walls that you see um, in an L shape around it, that is a concrete reservoir too. That is a 5 million gallon reservoir that was built around the tower in 1952. And that facility is still an active part of the city's water supply system. And I think there's still some construction going on there, um, but that's uh, why that construction is going on. They're um, rehabbing that uh, reservoir because it's still a very important part of the water supply system. So let's go back a little bit to the early years of development and examine a little bit of her story because this is Mary Jane Hartley and she was a matriarch of the Hartley family. And she also became known as the mother of the North Park District. She donated land on University Avenue near Ray Street in the Hartley's North Park tract to the city for North Park's first fire station in 1910. And the land was given to the city with a condition that they would establish an official fire department station there. And the resulting building shown here with its um, Campanile Tower uh, was used for drying hoses. And that gave North Park increased security from fire and an important civic landmark. Fire Station 14 on University Avenue was severely damaged in 1942 in a rainstorm. 
and was later rebuilt in its current location on Lincoln Avenue and 32nd Street. Mary Jane also commissioned the Nordberg Building at University and Grimm in 1926, and it became an important space for community events, um, including civic celebrations, community dancing, and banquets. You can see the sign here for tent dancing. The second floor, they hung these sort of gossamer uh, fabric because Valentino was all the rage at the time. And um, so that became some of the decorations for dancing under the tent. Um, so now this is the home of, um, of North Park Fitness. Um, and for a time, it was also um, the EF Groth building, and they are the ones that put up this um, nice plaque. And we appreciate that, along with the Main Street. Um, okay, so um, the North Park area is a great classroom to see the progression of early 20th century residential architecture. And through its individually unique homes, North Park illustrates the progressive development of style um, from Victorian transitional in the early 19 teens to pre-World War I craftsmen, our beautiful craftsmen, post-war period uh, revival, including Spanish revival and uh, minimal traditional sort of your 1940s um, pre-World War II um, style and also early ranch. So these homes in this, in this picture are in the North Park Dryden Historic District, which we established um, and the city approved in 2011. The neighborhood is along 28th Street and Pershing Avenue from Yupa Street to Landa Street. So let's take a little tour. The, this is uh, um, the location of the Dryden District between these two stars on 28th Street and Pershing. So part of the um, district is in the Park Villas tract and part is in um, the east side uh, on Long 28th Street is actually in the West End tract. And we really enjoy talking about architecture and North Park history on walking tours of the Dryden District. So Victorian transitional, um, the key, a key feature is the steep uh, cat slide roof. And this is one of four 1912 houses in the Dryden district. Note the sleeping porch. Um, this was considered very healthy at the time to sleep outside when you can. Um, and then this beautiful scrolled rafter tails. You don't get to see uh, this kind of finish on um, many homes now because these rafters, you know, they extend out beyond the protection of the gable and they get termite and, um, you know, and, and wear and tear and, and damage. And so people just um, cut them off. But when you can see many, many homes in North Park, University Heights would have been, uh, would still look quite a bit fancier <laughs> than they do now if they have been able to retain all of their um, beautiful finishes on their um, rafters and support structures. And then um, our beautiful craftsman style, my personal favorite. Um, we see a lot of those examples of the deep eaves and the prominent support structures, all part of the craftsman style. Um, also the beautiful porches, they might be large, they might be small. And um, all these different unique porch columns, just um, cobbles and um, Japanese style and brick and stucco, um, just incorporating some really uh, nice ways. And some of these um, columns help support the roof and sometimes they, um, they don't. They're just a place maybe to put your coffee mug in the morning on. So nearly 40 home, I'm sorry, nearly 40 home, I'm sorry, Dean, did you? And nearly 40 homes in the North Park um, Dryden district were uh, built by master builders, um, including 15 by Edward F. Ryans, who was nominated to that master builder status with the designation of the historic district. And the district encompasses 22 homes by master builder David Owen Dryden. And that represents the highest concentration of his homes in San Diego. So the homes pictured here were built by Dryden um, at the top and by Edward F. Ryan's um, down here. 
So this house on Pershing Avenue is a mix of Spanish and Mission revival styles uh, with the smaller porch and stucco facade common to both styles. The red tile is typical of the Spanish revival and parapets along the roof line are more typical of Mission revival style. Many homes of the 1920s incorporate multiple revival styles. They didn't have a rule book that said you had to build just one and they like to combine things. Uh, the trend of smaller porches, simpler designs, stucco facade, all reflect the post-World War I constraints of limited building materials and the influence of European architecture. Uh, of course, Spanish revival style became very popular in San Diego after the 1950-1916 exposition in um, North Park. And then the porch, you know, they turned to maybe there's a patio in the back. So there's this uh, evolution of our architecture that we see in many North Park homes. And then um, gradually then through the 30s and the 40s, um, design is progressing to be simpler and simpler. Um, this is a minimal traditional style house in the district uh, built about 1941, but still beautiful. You know, they just, um, we love them all. <laughs> Storybook style is kind of a fun, um, style that I wrote about in my um, little history snippets book. I, I love this style of architecture. It actually is rooted in a 1920s Los Angeles development named Hollywood Land. And according to the 2016 Los Angeles Historic Resources Survey, Hollywood Land started in 1923 as a picturesque community with winding streets and quaint houses in the French Norman, English Tudor, Mediterranean, and Spanish styles, or just a fanciful combination of all of the above. The 50 foot tall, 500 foot long sign proclaiming Hollywood land to advertise the community has lived on, right? It's a famous landmark without its last four letters, which were removed in the 1940s. One guideline to distinguish storybook from classic revival styles might be that if Hansel and Gretel or Cinderella could live there, then, you know, I think that it would, it would qualify to be storybook. Um, so I think that um, Hansel and Gretel would feel right at home in this beautiful uh, North Park house on Villa Terrace. It's west of the Dryden District. It's a 1929 house, and it's known by neighbors as the gingerbread house. Uh, the, there's a thatch roof effect, um, and that was in the design. It was meant to look like that originally, and asymmetrical frontage, a lot of decorative brickwork, and all the multiple gables are all distinguishing um, storybook features. And there are also some great storybook homes in University Heights, north of uh, University Avenue. So who is the North Park Historical Society? I know that's a burning question for you. Um, the North Park Historical Society, we established as, um, as we're all volunteer, independent 501c3 uh, nonprofit we established in 2008. And our mission is to help preserve North Park's cultural and architectural history through education and outreach. Another reason we appreciate this opportunity from Soho so much. Uh, we enjoy conducting guided walking tours in our outdoor classrooms, including in the Burlingame District and the Dryden District, the Commercial Core, and the uh, Morley Field Recreational Area, which we feel is our backyard. And we love giving walking tours there too. You would be surprised how much history there is at Morley Field. Um, and uh, last year in November, we, we led about 60, 60 third graders in uh, four groups um, from Jefferson Elementary School on a tour of the commercial area, which is right around their school. And they were very surprised to learn how many buildings are more than 90 years old. That really impressed <laughs> these young students. And how many um, of those buildings were originally grocery stores. Um, and it was really funny, kind of toward the end, one of uh, the kids said, 
I guess people just ate more then. I mean, they just like, why are there so many uh, grocery stores? Well, probably having very, very small refrigerators and ice boxes and that had something um, to do with that. Our organization achieved the City of San Diego Historic Designation status for the North Park Dryden Historic District on 28th Street and Pershing Avenue from Eupas to Landis in 2011. And then with the combined efforts of the North Park Historical Society, the University Heights Historical Society, McKinley Elementary School, and historian Alexander Bevel, who we owe a great deal of gratitude uh, to, the water tower at Howard Avenue, just north of the community park, was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2013, as well as the uh, surrounding area. Some of the other uh, features in that area are historically significant as well. And that received um, City of San Diego historic designation in 2015. We achieved a designation of uh, City of San Diego for, of John Pearson as a master builder in 2016. Among the houses he built are this beautiful Craftsman house on Dwight and 29th Street and this very lovely Spanish uh, eclectic um, on Texas Street near Myrtle Avenue. Both were completed in 1925 and both are historically designated. And we appreciate our fellow historian, Kari Koskinen, who allowed us to have access to um, ephemera associated with, um, with John uh, Pearson, who is brother of Master Builder Pear Pearson, so that we could get um, John on the Master Builder list as well. We uh, maintain a website at northparkhistory.org. Um, it includes under, um, under pro uh, projects, we have um, a searchable list of building permit uh, information uh, for over 900 homes. And also we have um, many um, articles about North Park history that our members and um, folks that were members of the um, history committee wrote um, years ago. We've got that up on, um, on this website as well as our meeting notes and um, other information that it's just fun to scroll through. And we are continue to be busy scanning uh, donated materials from uh, the Covington family and from others. Um, and we uh, just recently got this beautiful um, 1915 um, paper, it's not really a scrapbook, but anyway, it's just a, um, a collection of 46 pictures, um, large format from, um, from a friend of, of North Park Historical Society. He found it in his mother's uh, belongings after she passed and uh, gave it to us. And these are just beautiful um, pictures of the 1915 exposition, as well as some other scenes throughout um, San Diego and downtown and even this out to Lakeside. And then from the Covingtons, we received this um, photo album that has color um, photographs uh, postcards of um, Balboa Park from 1935, 36, and other scenes in San Diego, and we've been we've scanned all those as well. And finally, I want to acknowledge um, Don and Karen Covington. Maybe many of you on the call knew these people personally. Um, I personally never did have the honor to meet Don Covington. Um, he passed away before. My husband and I got involved in um, North Park, but um, I worked very closely with Karen and um, just have so much respect for these people. Um, so they, along with other members of what's our forerunner uh, organization, they were the history committee of the North Park Community Planning Association. Don was a chair and Karen was the secretary uh, of the committee for many years during the 1980s and 1990s. Don passed away in 2002 and Karen passed away in uh, 2012. 
And uh, Don compiled these handwritten lists uh, containing over a thousand building um, permit information. He would go down and go through the paper copies of the daily transcript and copy out the information um, for uh, homes in, in North Park from the very early 1900s um, up to um, more current times. And he, um, we've scanned all of those tablets, all those handwritten um, tablets, and those are the basis for our um, interactive uh, searchable uh, database. And he also authored, of course, the history of North Park, uh, 1896 to 1946. And then um, they compiled information that became the basis for um, all of the DPRs and the um, statement of significance and everything, the information you need to put together to build a foundation for the application of the Dryden District. Um, yeah, we're standing on their shoulders for sure. So thank you for your attention, even though I can't see any of you, you I <laughs> hope that that's been engaging for you. And um, I'm assuming that you've been as attentive as the students in the study hall at San Diego High School in 1912. And I'll let Dean coordinate how we do questions and answers. Hi, thank you, Catherine. Oh, we're getting some. I was all, there's aren't many questions coming in yet, but we do have a few. Let's just start at the top. Brian wants to know uh, if you remember Drowsy Maggie's, a terrific music place when there wasn't much nightlife outside of La Jolla. Yeah, it's, it's Urban Pizza now, that building. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever forgive Marcus for <laughs> selling out, but you know, restaurant business is really hard. We love Drowsy Maggie's, uh, the music, the food. It was incredible. Um, I remember <laughs> one time we were there eating and the band's playing and they're and they're uh they're doing this song that they call Tyrannosaurus Rex, and the whole restaurant is participating. I'm the chorus, which is Tyrannosaurus Rex, he goes, Rawr. so we're all doing that, and this couple walks in right when the whole restaurant is going. Rawr. And I think they still came in. Um, that was just a wonderful classic um, place. And it, um, you know, we almost lost the whole building because they didn't secure it. Um, there had been somebody driving, hit the gas main on the um, backside and uh, there was a fire. And then it was vacant and um, not secured. Um, but through a miracle, it did. Um, survive and and I think uh, Urban Pizza is just great. They've been there a long time now too. Great. Um, it looks a couple people have asked about um, ongoing uh, walking tours of North Park or even self guided uh, walking tours and where they where they can access those. Right. So you know, COVID really put a dent in our. Um, walking tour uh, activities, but we are coming out of that. Uh, we have been working with the um, City of San Diego Community College, uh, Rediscovering San Diego uh, class. Um, and we have been doing walking tours for the tend to be senior citizens, uh, senior emeritus kind of um, classes. Um, and we've been doing walking tours uh, last couple of years. Um, for them, we're gonna take a group of them on a new walking tour that we've just recently developed of Polly's edition, which was um, which is between Alabama and Arizona, uh, from Ubus to, to Landis. And we do about a mile loop on um, Mississippi Street, Ubus and then Mississippi Street, and then um, back south to the park on Texas. And that is a walking tour we're gonna do in April for them. Um, and we love to do the Morley Field. And then we just, as I said, for Jefferson, we did the commercial area. And we just took the um, North Park Main Street um, Board of Directors around the commercial area as well. So we are open to uh, conducting a tour. Um, I don't know, Dean, you have, um, you know, my contact information can be given to anyone who is interested. 
Okay. Um, and we'll work, work with them. Um, and we are gonna, uh, we're planning um, in probably June, a Morley Field uh, walking tour, sort of a come one, come all, that we'll um, advertise on our website and um, um, see how many people we can, we can get to um, tour around that as well. So uh, we're definitely open to, to doing that now, finally, again. <laughs> and we have our board as kind of um, developing the philosophy that we don't charge. We just ask folks to donate and so we don't have to um, mess so much with tickets and um, all that kind of processing. So that's sort of our philosophy um, right now. So we're very, very open. Somebody wants to get a group of friends together and they'd love to get a guided tour of the Dryden district where you're happy to do that too. So we're open to, to that. Okay, we're getting some questions about how to get involved in North Park Historical Society and um, getting on a, a mailing list for this sort of thing rather than having to check the website. Right. So um, last year, we decided that um, we would keep our mailing list to our uh, our members. And so our uh, membership is $20 a year. Uh, we just got Venmo. <laughs> so uh, folks can, it's not like on the website, but um, it's, I don't know if they, at North Park Historical. Um, and um, so that's our, our membership dues. And then I add your email to our distribution list. And then you're the first ones to um, find out anything that we're doing and you get the monthly um, meeting summaries, which are sort of like a newsletter. Um, and that helps support our activities. Our meetings are open. They're not very exciting. Um, attending meetings is not required for membership. Um, so you know, but um, you get a very thorough summary of everything that we're uh, doing um, in the monthly um, meeting summaries. And we, we would welcome new new members. And then we need, um, it's wonderful when we can get helpers on our walking tours and that's a fun way to experience the walking tour. Um, so, um, and as I said, we're gonna be more actively doing walking tours. And so those nice opportunities for for folks, I think, and we appreciate that question <laughs> very much. Thank you. All right. Um, besides city directories, is there a better way to date a house in North Park? Um, yeah, the, the limitation of the city directories is the reverse part only goes back to 1926. So if your house is older than that, if you get lucky, the owner in 1926 is still, you know, the owner, you can go back to older directories with that name and see if they still, you know, if they're in that house earlier. On the city clerk's uh, digital archives website, there are other scanned documents besides the directories. There's um, the lot book documents which are the ones that you have to know the block and lot and the name of the subdivision and you can go into those books and um with that information and go back and now so in, in the lot books there's two columns one is the value of the real estate and one is the value of improvements and when you see somebody's paying taxes on the value of improvements that is when you know that there's a structure on the lot and that's a pretty good indication. Sometimes people ask us, well, you know, I've seen the little dates, the years on the sidewalk, right? Is that when the houses were built? Well, it's when the sidewalk was laid. Um, those are sidewalk stamps. The name you'll see is the company or the, who uh, poured them. And the date is usually like the month and the year. And I like to say it's an advertisement or it's a confession, depending on the quality of the work. Um, so it's an indication of when 
homes were being built there, but it is not the year exactly. Um, but when I start, there's another little trick that I just learned from our newest board member, Allison. She, uh, and we both have access to uh, the digital archives, the historic archives of the San Diego Union. And you can, um, in searching, you can put in the address and see, sometimes you get very lucky and you will see the, the permit, you know, the building permit uh, will come up. And so that's another good one. And then on our website under projects, I showed you there's historical building permits. And if you input the address, if you're one of the lucky 900, um, that building permit uh, information has been compiled on our website. You were being asked, uh, where is the building currently on the screen right now, that school building? That building is part of San Diego High, historic San Diego High. And so that beautiful, beautiful building does not exist anymore. And we have a question, um, and I don't know the answer to this. I'd heard um, about the um, unfortunate PSA plane crash in 1978. Is um, is there a memorial at that site or is there still a plan to put one there? Uh, mm -hmm. I do not know the status of that. Um, one pathetic memorial, which is ridiculous, is at the library, the little baby plaque. Um, uh, but there is um, in the uh, um, Aerospace Museum, I know people involved made sure that that plaque got accurate because I think there were, I don't know, some news missing or something. So anyway, I believe that the plaque at the Aerospace Museum is um, is accurate. But as far as the site itself, the extreme difficulty about this terrible incident is that it's in a neighborhood. You know, it's a current neighborhood and People have different feelings about how extensive a memorial should be there. There's no question there should be something there. Yeah. yeah. And I believe that's all our questions for today. You've got lots of uh, nice compliments in our chat. Oh, yay. Will you tell me later? <laughs> I think you should be able to read those. <laughs> no, oh, no. Do I, oh, do I look at them? Yeah, you can. Um, Oh, okay. And it looks like we're going to be able to end right on time today. Oh, um, boy. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Catherine. I learned so much about North Park, as it sounds like everybody else did, too. Um, thank you to our audience today. We hope to see you next month on the second Saturday for Penning the Past, Insights into San Diego's Historic Neighborhoods and Architecture. And remember that Catherine's books are also for sale at the Marston House Museum Shop. Um, thank you for your support of SOHO and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone.